Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Richard Olesky, um, who has for over a decade been working with fruit bats on the Indian Ocean Islands, focusing on the role in the tropical forest ecosystem. In Mauritius, he focuses on the human fruit bat, fruit bat conflict, education of the local population, as well as for restoration. And also, uh, Richard uh, researches the movement pattern of the bats, their social structure, learning abilities, and the choices they make. Richard is also the director of the Ecosystem Restoration Alliance Indian Ocean, which is the only NGO in Mauritius that exclusively specializes in bat research, conservation, and bat ecosystem interactions. And today he will be talking to us about conservation challenges in Mauritius. So um, thank you very much for joining us today, uh, Richard, and over to you. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, um, okay. I'll just, uh, okay. I'll just uh, need to stop I mean, sharing my screen yeah. so you can share yours. Yeah. Uh, does that work yes perfect we can see your presentation now okay perfect okay hello everyone thank you for joining and um, so i will talk a bit about the conservation challenges in mauritius obviously connected to the uh, bad conservation um so just about the mauritius a bit now, uh, that's probably one of the most famous pictures of Mauritius uh, with the optic illusion of the underwater waterfall. Uh, but basically, this is how Mauritius is seen as a paradise island. Uh, more about the geography, Mauritius is uh, one of uh, three Mascaren Islands just uh, east of uh, Madagascar, and it's one of the biodiversity hotspots, uh, which contains Madagascar and the Indian Ocean Islands like uh, Mauritius Comoros and Seychelles as well. Uh, Mauritius is uh, quite a young island. Uh, it uh, has been, I think it emerged in around 8 million years ago, but being a small island, an isolated island, it actually hasn't been colonized but, uh, by people and never had any indigenous people. So firstly, it was discovered around the 10th century by Arabs. Uh, but never really colonized. The, the Portuguese after that came around 1507 and 1513, but they also never colonized, never been interested in the island, and they left. The first colonization came with the uh, Dutch people, uh, so they appeared on the island in the 1598, and uh, it took them a bit more time to actually colonize it, and the colonization started uh, from 1638. Uh, and this is when the Dutch uh, tried their best to stay on the island, but actually they, after around 20 years uh, of their colony, they had to leave the island uh, because of the cyclones and uh, some of the pests they introduced, like rats already, which were eating their supplies of food. Uh, so they abandoned the island, and this is when the island came uh, in French hands. And the French kept it from 1715 to 1810. Uh, Basically, the island started to develop in around uh, 1735, and this is when the uh, farming and exploitation of the forest started and continued uh, until the British colony, which started in 1810, when the British overtook the uh, Mauritius from French. And um, they stayed on the island until 1968, uh, when Mauritius gained their independence, and then uh, they became a republic in around 19, no, not even now, actually in uh, 1992. So this is probably how Mauritius looked when the Dutch and Portuguese arrived. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, there's Le Morne actually that uh, from the first picture, that's the, um, that's the mountain. Uh, so it was covered in forest uh, with a lot of animals and trees. Obviously the famous Dodo is there. Again, another idyllic uh, picture of all the animals, together and all the forest around the, uh, around them. Another one, uh, which also represents a very dense, nice uh, forest. Uh, you can already see that there were bats here on the right and tortoises, giant tortoises in the back as well, and loads of uh, endemic uh, plants. 
So as the colonization started, obviously the disappearance of the forest started as well. So Mauritius was 100 person covered in forest. And since 17th century, the forest started to decline very, very quickly. People were harvesting uh, hardwood species like ebony and uh, export it to Europe or build ships from it and all the other stuff. And they kept the reforestation going until uh, the uh, 20th century, basically. So from what used to be 100% forest, now is around 2% of a quality forest. That doesn't mean primary forest. All the primary forest has been lost. And uh, only around 2% is being seen as a good quality secondary forest. So this is how Mauritius looks now. It's all sugarcane. Some patches of forest, most, most likely uh, invasive forest. Sugarcane around, again, some mountains and sugarcane around. Nice mountains, lovely views, but all cover around in sugarcane and invasive forest. Once again, when you see on the light landscape, it's just sugarcane, some patches, small patches of, uh, of trees and mountains in the background. So obviously, because Mauritius has been isolated for a very, very long time, and um, it's been a small oceanic island, uh, it evolved a high endemism. So from, so with very high endemism on the island, what happens is when the people actually colonize the island or start to use the island, uh, the high extinction starts as well. So from around 691, flowering plants found in Mauritius, uh, at least 39% of them are endemic. So for a small island like Mauritius, which is around 45 kilometers but by 65 kilometers, uh, it's actually a lot, a lot, a lot of plants. The other thing is that for such a small island, Mauritius also exhibit a, a variety of uh, microclimates. So you had the coastal forest, you have a dry forest, you've got the transitional, transitional forest. You also have a... a a uh, wet tropical forest and actually a cloud forest. Obviously, most of them, the habitats do not exist anymore. But this topography of the island uh, actually allowed the plants and animals to evolve in extraordinary way. So we're talking about at least 39% of endem to the endemism to the island, uh, which is around 270 species, I believe. And that's why IUCN uh, described Mauritius as a center of plant diversity, again, for the unique uh, feature that such a small island is so diverse. Uh, unfortunately, 89% of the endemic flora is already threatened, uh, with at least 61 species of plants already classified as extinct. And uh, from all the mascarine endemics, so as it says here, 141. Uh, okay, so 141 species are already critically endangered, and 89 taxa is represented by 10 or less individuals, and... Uh, I believe another five taxa is known just by a single individual. So the extinction is ongoing in a sense, like if we do not manage to propagate those plants, they're gonna virtually go extinct in a very, very short time. Uh, when it comes to animals, the same thing. Uh, Mauritius uh, actually was mostly colonized by reptiles and birds. Uh, there was no amphibians on the island uh, and the only mammals were obviously bats. So from all of the uh, vertebrate species they had uh, on Mauritius, 24 species have already been extinct. Uh, 12 species of birds remain. And from 17 no endemic reptile species, only 12 remain now. And some of them are restricted to the small islets around the island. <clears throat> so this is just to show how the extinction went quite quickly from the 17th century, uh, when we had the uh, flightless parrots, then we had the hand, then obviously famous Dodo, we'll talk about it in a bit. Grey parrots, blue pigeon, giant tortoise, one of the bat species, and most recently was the uh, boa, which I think in 1975 was declared extinct. So the extinction is kind of ongoing. Uh, so what contributed so much to the extinction is apart from the fact that the habitat was completely destroyed, uh, and also the fact that Mauritius evolved with no predators and no mammals actually roaming on the ground, it allowed Mauritius to evolve all those all those flightless species of birds, which could freely live in any of the habitats on the islands, and they didn't fear uh, any of the predators. So from the 16th century, so as the Dutch came, they started to introduce domestic animals like goats, like cats. The rats probably came with the 
uh, with the boats. The monkeys were already present in 17th centuries along with the deer, uh, which was uh, taken, I think, introduced from Java. Wild pigs came, mongoose, after that giant snails, uh, uh, toads, and so on, loads of animals, and all that contributed to, to the extinction uh, in Mauritius. So when it comes to the famous dodo, Basically, it's the worst first documented extinction. What happens is Mauritius was, colon was one of the last places on earth that got colonized by humans, but within literally 300 years, we managed to completely destroy the habitat. And Dodo was last recorded seen in 1662, so the second part of the 17th century. So basically within 17 years of the colonization, the Dodo went extinct. Uh, so that's the human's impact. However, many people say that Dodo was eaten by people. Uh, I'm sure they tried it, but we believe that most likely it uh, went extinct due to the fact that it was flightless bird, which laid one egg a year on the ground. And the introduction uh, introduction of the of the cats of the monkeys uh, of the rats uh, threatened the eggs or probably destroyed the eggs and also the chicks. So this is how we face the aging population and eventually uh, Dodo disappeared. Obviously, at that time, no one really cared about it that much, but we managed to actually record the first world's, uh, world's uh, extinction of the species. And uh, obviously, apart from the animals, the domestic animals which were introduced to Mauritius, and uh, there was loads of ornamental plants and exotic plants, uh, most of them during the 18th century, I believe, during the French colony. So in total, at least 1,060, 675 exotic plant species were introduced. Not of them, not all of them are invasive, but a lot of them are. And at least 20 of them are very aggressive invasive species. And the uh, uh, example is the Chinese guava uh, or privet or the Liancef, which is Sibitash. Uh, so these are three of many species which basically destroy the forest. So this is a bad quality uh, picture taken from one of the students. Uh, so basically what happens when it comes to guava, when you look on the right side, on the top picture, this is a forest you see, right? It's very dense. When you start to see the guavas and start to remove the guavas, what you see on the left is that there's actually not much of the endemic species left. So the earlier area of view is a bit better, when on the right, again, you see canopy cover, uh, like close canopy of the forest. And on the, on the left, you will see that once the uh, guava is removed, we have only a few endemic species left. This is how invasive guava is. It grows extremely robust, uh, very fast, uh, in a very, very dense uh, manner, and it just doesn't allow anything else to germinate and grow. The lion self, again, not the best picture. So basically, the liana uh, introduced, uh, again, around I believe 17th century, it's wind dispersed. It was introduced as ornamental species, if I'm correct. And uh, due to the fact that it uh, produces a lot of seeds, which can spread by wind very easily, it managed to invade all of the Mauritius. And uh, the thing again is it's a liana, so it's gonna go up the trees looking for uh, looking for sun. And in that way, it's gonna actually strangle the, the trees and they're gonna die. The other thing is just because it dispersed so quickly by the, uh, by the seeds, it creates a huge cover, like a huge seedling bank just of the of the Liancep, just of the species, and that doesn't allow anything else to germinate there. So once the species is pre present and it's not removed, nothing else will grow there. And apart from that, within the time, it's gonna kill all the large trees, uh, and endemic trees. And also with the high invasion in the forest, we know that the reproduction of the trees will change. They will start. They will stop fruiting. They will stop flowering. So basically, it ceases the reproduction, uh, reproduction or the regeneration of the forest. So not all of the Mauritius is uh, uh, just uh, bad stories. Uh, there are good stories. So uh, there are four species of birds, which basically um, Mauritius managed to save uh, with the help of now called Martian Wildlife Foundation and Professor Carl Jones, uh, when he started to work in the eighties in Mauritius. So this is basically when the conservation of Mauritius started around 1980s. Uh, so they managed to uh, revive Kestrel, which was narrowed to only a few individuals in the wild. The same with the pink pigeon. There were just a few of them left. They managed to breed them. They managed to reintroduce them. Now I think both populations are around four or 500. Still not a lot, but it's better than it was. The same with the endemic eco parakeet or the Mauritian 40, and just for, for examples. But uh, the conservation work done or fr from 80s until now managed to bring those uh, species actually back from the brink of extinction. So apart from the fact that the Mauritius is so damaged and it's a good example of like how humans can impact 
the ecosystem, it's also a bookcase scenario of how conservation is done. So there's not many of those stories around the world, but I think Mauritius always listed as, as one of them, that if you really try and uh, focus on the conservation, you may manage to uh, basically save the species. And uh, that's what happened here. So going back to bats and the mammals, obviously, as it happens in many isolated islands, bats are the only mammals which manage to occupy it or colonize it, if you want. So Mauritius had three fruit bat species. Uh, there was Pleopus sub-Niger, which got extinct, uh, I think, around the 17th, 18th century. Uh, it was a smaller fruit bat. There, is, there was Pleopus rhodogensis. So this bat uh, used to be in Mauritius, but it got extinct from Mauritius, and now it's present in Rodrigues. So it's... Uh, uh, Rodrigues is another island which belongs uh, from Mascaren, which belongs to Mauritius. So the species is doing quite well on the island. And in Mauritius, we only have the Pteropus niger, and that's the Mauritian fruit bat, and it's present only on this on this island. Uh, so uh, about Pteropus niger, it's a medium-sized bat, I would say between 400 to 600 grams. Uh, it's a large bat, but they are larger. Uh, as most of the fruit bats were, has very low reproductive uh, rates, so we're talking about one pup a year. Um, we believe that the females get uh, sexually mature around four years old. Um, the mating season starts in between April and June. Uh, the youngs are then born between October and December, but it may start as early as September and sometimes last until January. And uh, the gestation pe period is around four months and the lactation period is also around for four months. So they can raise one pup a year uh, from the time when female is at least four years old. So it takes quite a long time actually to, uh, to increase the population. Uh, as in many isolated islands or um, island ecosystem, the fruit bats are playing a major role uh, as a seed disperser. So given that all the birds in Mauritius were uh, most of the birds were ground dwelling and can disperse the seeds, bats were the only flying mammals which can handle large uh, large seed and disperse around the forest uh, excuse me so um they're important for seed dispersal they important for pollination and now for connecting the isolated forest patches we'll talk about it more later uh so in mauritius they recorded to feed on at least 55 species of native trees but i believe this number is growing now uh, so we discover more and more uh, three species the bats are feeding on. When it comes to seed dispersal, they disperse it in few ways. So basically, when you look at the two top uh, picture and the uh, uh, bottom left one, you can see what we call a uh, spat out. So basically, the fruit bud will take the fruit, chew it in the mouth, will suck out the juices, and then uh, discard either the seed or the remaining fiber. So sometimes you can find the seeds uh, in the uh, spat out. Sometimes you will find that the, uh, the seeds basically are intact, clear from the flesh and uh, drop on the ground. And obviously they will disperse the seeds uh, uh, in their feces as well. So the main advantage is that the bat will come, feed on the tree, drop the seeds. But uh, uh, what is most important is that it will go from one tree to another, carrying the fruits or all over the island actually, and able to disperse those seeds uh, between different habitats. And now, in Mauritius, this is the only animal which is able to do it. Obviously, they always were very important in pollination because they did not only eat fruits, they also uh, feed on flowers, uh, on the nectar and all the pollen. So worldwide, we know that they pollinate over 500 plant species. Some of them are very uh, import, commercially important, actually. In Mauritius, we know just a few plants they pollinate. We never really done a proper study uh, about the pollination, and this is something I always wanted to do. So hopefully at some time, uh, at some point, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to do it because I'm pretty sure that they pollinate more than we think. Uh, so the problem in Mauritius is that uh, with the decreasing forest, the bats are feeding extensively on the commercial fruits. So Mauritius has a lot of lychee plantation as well as uh, mango plantation. So the orchards and the backyards will have mango, lychee, or also longan. And obviously these are the fruits that bats really like to eat. And this is why since at least, I think since around 2002, Martian uh, farmers were trying to lobby the government to actually cease, uh, to actually start killing the bats or allow them to kill the bats or organize a cull. Uh, 
because they claim that the bats were eating 100% of all the fruits, uh, commercial fruits in Mauritius. So this is when I came to Mauritius in 2014 to try to see uh, what, what is actually the damage the bats are causing to the to the farms, because uh, we've heard a lot of numbers and so on, but no one ever really conducted, conducted like a proper study to justify it. Uh, so first thing you realize is that it's not only bats that eating the commercial fruits. We have invasive uh, birds doing that, like this uh, bulbul feeding on the mango. Here we go, the invasive uh, parakeet. It's not the echo parakeet. It's the invasive one, which is still here. Also feeding on the mango. Uh, here we go, mina, another one uh, feeding on lychee. And obviously we also have rats which are climbing the trees and eating. They mostly damage the unripe. Uh, fruits, so those which are not even like premature, actually, just uh, just eating through the skin and eating the seed inside. So basically, when we started to work to try to justify the damage, we had to start to recognize those uh, those different types of damage caused to the fruits. Huh? It wasn't only the bats; it was also the birds. There was natural drop. We found that there are fungal infection, uh, which happens to the fruits. Uh, we've got rats. We've got also immature fruits naturally dropping from the tree, which is normal. So by counting thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, lychee a day under the trees, we came with the average of what the bats are doing. So in this general uh, example, uh, it turns that on this one tree, the bat damaged around 19% of the fruits. Huh? So uh, there, there's, uh, the total damage is quite big, but the bats do not contribute that much. Uh, However, in 2015, the Mauritius passed the new biodiversity bill, which allowed them to call any species uh, a pest. Basically, the fruit bats in Mauritius were protected since 1992, so nationally protected, obviously internationally on ICN as well, and, and they've been protected. But just because there was so much problem uh, with the farmers bullying the government, they passed a new law that any species, even if it's uh, endemic and endangered, can be listed as pest if the population grows to, su uh, to such number that it's uh, it's getting out of control and actually causing uh, problems or damage to, uh, uh, to, I guess, plantation or like whatever else they want. Uh, so we also at that time, so in 2014-15, we managed to do a first GPS tracking of those bats to try to look at the movements. So we used those uh, microwave telemetry tags at the time. These were GPS GSM tags. So uh, they had solar panels around and here a small one at the back. And they also had the SIM card uh, uh, inserted in it. So basically the tag was recharging during the day, recording the uh, movement of the bus during the night and every morning uh, data was sent directly to the email through the GSM mobile system. So that was quite, uh, quite nice and uh, uh yeah uh and easy actually because we didn't have to chase the bats we didn't have to walk after them we didn't have to come with the antenna to download the data they didn't really have to retrieve the tag obviously it would be nice to retrieve and uh, reuse it but uh, i think we haven't managed uh but this is basically uh, what we did so we managed to take 12 bats within two years of the study i believe uh the fixes during the night weren't as frequent as we would like in the evening, because the battery was fully charged, the tag would start giving us a very nice fixes quite often. And then by the end of the night, the fixes could be like every one hour or every two hours. And eventually, if the tag felt that the battery is too low, it will stop recording any data just to save the battery for, for another day. Uh, so this is an example of a single night movement on Mauritius. So in Mauritius of a bat, which uh, started in Black River here and went all towards the north. So again, the, the size of the island is... Uh, around 45 kilometers wide and uh, 65 uh, kilometers long. So as you can see, the bat easily can within one night come to another any other part of the island. So this is uh, what we got from six bats, and you can see they use uh, the island extensively and travel all over the island. Uh, the points are quite big actually here, but I didn't manage to change them now. Um, so basically, yeah, they, they managed just a few bats managed within a few months managed to, uh, so here we go, what, like six months, they managed to travel all over the island. Uh, so at some point, we started to realize that uh, there's kind of a pattern. So uh, the bats, the clusters of the points were in main three, three areas of Mauritius, and that corresponds with the mountain chains. So we've got the Black River Gorges Mountain, uh, which is also a national park. Then we've got Mocha, and then we've got Bamboo. On the on the east so basically these are the mountain chains and that means that this is where the rest of the forest actually remains 
So majority of the lowland won't have any forest. Uh, Black River Gorges have the best quality forest, and then mocha and bamboo will have the forest uh, on the top of the mountain. The quality is questionable. So yeah, so from the data, we got that the bats uh, can travel up to 90 kilometers in one night, so they can easily go from south to north and then come back to the south to, uh, to sleep. Uh, obviously, that tells us that they're able to um, disperse the seeds all over the island, along with the pollen as well, so they can pollinate the plants uh, around the island. Uh, generally, the fruit bats have a fast uh, gut retention time, uh, so it should be less than 30 minutes. We've, I've done it in Madagascar, uh, but we haven't really done it in Mauritius yet, so it would be something also to look at to just to see how fast uh, uh, the digestion goes. Um, they obviously sit uh, long distance seed dispersers, and they're the only species in Mauritius now which is able to actually connect the forest fragments. Uh, none of the birds would do that, and none of the birds would be able to disperse the seeds because majority of the birds which are left here now, they basically feed on the smaller seeds. The endemic birds are artificially fed, uh, and they basically play no role in the ecosystem anymore. So basically, the bats are the only species which, is, which are keeping the forest intact. Uh, but si since 2015, obviously, everyone decided that since there is a cow, it's legal to kill bats now. So as you can see, there are some pictures we, we've seen on social media when people literally just kill the bats and throw them in the boxes or on the street. They obviously, to deter the bats from the lychee tree, they started to crucify the bats on the on the sticks, as you can see. So they basically, they kill the bat and they spread it on a bamboo stick and put at the top of the tree, in a sense, thinking probably that the bat flying around and seeing a dead bat uh, will just return and won't eat uh, the lychee. I don't think it works. Uh, obviously, the cyclones is the major concern. So Mauritius uh, is in a cyclone area. Uh, the cyclones usually, the cyclone season is between November and March, I think. Most often between like January and March, let's say, where the cyclone will happen. So there's always a big concern about it. And there's a big concern about it because if a, Mauritius haven't seen a cyclone in like at least more than 10 or 15 years, uh, the cyclone, if it comes, it is able to decimate the population of the bats. So given the fact that the bats are already culled by the government, they've been culling the bat until 2021. And they probably, they must have at least killed 40% of the whole population. Now, if we receive a cyclone, like a proper cyclone, which will hit Mauritius, the population may go extinct. And that obviously triggered the IUCN uh, status and move the uh, Topus Niger from vulnerable to endangered. So coming back to the uh, human wildlife conflict or the uh, human fruit bat conflict, this is the data from 2015. So after after the uh, the cal, so these are average uh, damage by bats in some of the major orchards across the Mauritius. So you can see it's from nine percent to seventy percent. So it depends on the area. So we also realize that some areas are less, uh, there's less pressure on some of the oral charts uh, than on another. Uh, in average, in general, <clears throat> we estimated the damage to be around 26% on the big trees. So basically there's also a difference between the tree. Uh, any tree which is below four, like from four meters and below is unlikely for the bats, uh, the damage the bats close to them will be much lower than to the larger trees. And uh, often on the smaller trees, it's the birds which will cause the most of the damage. On the large trees, we have more, more bats uh, feeding. So we also started to implement the netting as the only way to protect the crops. Uh, the netting used to be done in Mauritius, but uh, on the canopy of the trees. So we started to play with, uh, with the frame. So use the PVC pipes just to see uh, if we can actually net the tree ensuring that the net does not touch the canopy of the tree or the fruits. And uh, uh, from what we found is that uh, uh, from the 9% of the damage, which was in the North Orchard, the, using the netted, uh, using the nets on the trees limited the damage to one or 0.5%. So almost completely the medin another orchard the net done without the frame just on the just on the canopy of the tree reduced the damage from 53 percent to 12 percent so they are efficient and it actually is uh, uh, it is a way to protect the fruits uh, the problem with the netting is that it's uh, 
it's very labor demanding, so it's very difficult to put the nets on. Depends on the size of the tree. On the small trees, it may be easier. On the large trees, it's much more difficult. So it takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of men power to actually put the nets. Then you would need to make sure that you secure the nets well uh, to make sure that the bats do not go under the net just by climbing it down. Uh, there is obviously a problem with the fact that the bats constantly get entangled to the net and then die. So um, it's also uh, ethically maybe not the best option. So with all the color and the things we're doing in the orchard and my two, two years uh, spent in Mauritius, uh, I decided I'm gonna stay for a bit longer and open an NGO. And this is when ERA came to life. Uh, we realized that uh, there is a need for more research when it comes to bats. And obviously the human, human wildlife conflict, it's, uh, it's a main issue here and has to be handled. Uh, we also realized that there's need for like more holistic approach to conservation in Mauritius. So the NGOs working in Mauritius, they're really species oriented. So they focus on certain species to protect. Uh, but nowadays we know that species oriented conservation is not the best way to conserve it, to conserve the species. It's, uh, it's extremely expensive and it doesn't bring the species back to play any role in the ecosystem. So only if we look at the species, as a part of the ecosystem, this is the best way we can conserve it. So we decided that we'll try to do that. And obviously we included a lot of education, which is needed. So we started to play with other deterrents, uh, not only the, in the net. So we decided to, so we've seen the paper from Madagascar that Planskid, which is a deer repairant, worked on the lychee in Madagascar and deterred the bats from eating the lychee. So we decided to do it in Mauritius, and then we realized that actually we can't use the plant skid because it contains blood and the blood comes from the pig. So having the majority of the population being Muslim and Hindu, it was impossible to use a pig blood on the uh, on the fruits. So we decided to play with other organic and uh, repellent, which will have uh, just mixes of herbs and spices. So we could, we've done all this uh, uh, flags, red flags. We soak them for, I think, 24 hours in the repellent. And then when place them up on the trees uh, to see if the smell itself is gonna uh, gonna deter the bats. Uh, so from the data, as you can see, uh, the first one is control, and then these are the different uh, repellents we used. Uh, generally, there's a trend in a sense that it did decrease the the damage, but uh, nothing significant enough. And the data is a bit scattered, but it's some indication to say that maybe it will work well uh, if we can. Come with a different method of applying it. Applying it just on the flags uh, was, first of all, it limited the area and actually the repellent works. Second of all, if it was raining, we'd have to reapply uh, constantly the repellent and this is something we didn't do. But over this time, when we we're doing all these um, experiments, also with the, uh, uh, here with the different repellents, uh, we realized that actually compared to the 2015 uh, data, so when the cal started, uh, the damage in the orchard actually started to increase. So after two years of cull, we started to record more damage to the lychee tree. So basically that was one of the main proofs to say that, okay, so the cull doesn't work. Obviously we knew it's not gonna work, but uh, we realized there's another problem. If they're killing the population and it's decreasing year by year, but uh, uh, but from year to year, the damage in the orchard is increases, increasing. That means that uh, there's some other problem. We also came with the idea that we're gonna apply a uh, automated system, sound system, we called it literally, uh, which basically will play over 80 different random sounds from like barking, uh, predator calls, firecrackers, whatever you can imagine actually. Um, and play it at completely random uh, intervals and for random time over the five speakers. So also the uh, the speaker which the sound would come from will be random. And additionally, it will flash the lights uh, at a completely random uh, uh, schedule. So we apply that with one system with the five speakers and four lights. We managed to cover around 20 trees, I believe. And uh, it was quite nice to see that the damage uh, which was at the time 18% for the control, went down to 3 and 5%. So basically we managed to reduce the damage by 80% in the lychee. And then when it comes to mango, uh, we decreased the manage, uh, we managed to decrease the damage uh, by 67%. So that was quite successful. We have retested it last year and we're planning to do more this year. 
<clears throat> and obviously we implemented the first full netting in Mauritius. So this is like an exposure netting when you basically net the whole orchard on the poles with the net. And uh, and yeah, and that obviously we knew it's going to give us 100% protection and that's what it did. It, it gave us 100% protection. The problem is, again, that is very labor demanding. It's not cheap as well because all those poles and nets, they cost a lot of money. So other things... Uh, we've been doing is obviously active education so i believe we are the only one who do that uh, we are basically scheduling talks in all the social welfare centers schools private companies and uh, deliver the talks about Mauritius, about the human wildlife conflict about the need for restoration of the ecosystem and so on we do pre and post uh, talk interviews in a sense like uh, yeah like questionnaires so we ask the participant first to fill the questionnaire. After we del deliver the talk, we give them exactly the same questionnaire to fill again. And then we can compare whether we actually made any difference, whether the talk, like what from the talk actually was uh, uh, was remembered and uh, whether it had any uh, impact on the people. I don't have the data to show here. Obviously the major thing for us now is the forest restoration. Uh, so this is the, let's say the the project which is constantly running. It's a, it's a demanding project. Uh, so because we know that the damage, even though the population of the bats decreased and the damage in the orchard is increasing, uh, the main problem is probably the fact that there is no much forest left in Mauritius. And with the high invasion, which is still ongoing, without the restoration of the forest, the availability of the fruits will constantly decrease. So there will be less and less fruits in the forest for bats to feed and more pressure on the commercial crop. Um, also, uh, we need to remember that, let's say, there are rats which damage the fruits. There are also monkeys in the forest with which actually uh, uh, fit on the same fruits the bats do. So there's a huge competition for them. So this is one of our restoration sites. I mean, it's a lovely view. When you look at the forest, it seems like a nice and dense forest. But if you look at the uh, lower left side, this is the this is a, a, a patch of a forest we're actually restoring. So as I showed with the guava here, again, this forest is 90% at least uh, invaded. You can see that one, once we remove the invasive, there's not much left. So this is how it looks. Again, at the in the background, you've got nice chunky forest. But when you actually go and start to remove the invasive species, you end up with like single trees standing. And that's it. And all these uh, endemics are replanted. So we, we constantly replant. So in those areas highly invaded, we try to aid the uh, uh, reforestation. So we try to introduce as many as, as possible of those species we're supposed to actually grow in the forest just to surplus the, uh, the the spreading of the invasive species. Also, apart from that, we have to weed uh, the area at least twice a year. So literally, we have to go there and remove all the invasive species which are uh, which are reappearing in a, in a site. So uh, yeah, again, here you can see that in the background, it looks like a very nice forest, but trust me, there's not much there. We also started with the uh, new nurseries so we're happy to say that we we expanded in a sense that the new nursery now looks better but it's completely finished uh, it can accommodate up to twenty five thousand trees a year so in the restoration area on the five hectares we already planted fifteen thousand trees now by the end of the year we're hoping to have another 20 twenty thousand trees to to plant we also do project on the mormopterus i don't know how much time i have left uh, so uh, that's another bat which is endemic to mauritius uh, we managed to uplist it on IUCN. So basically within the last 20 years, the population decreased by 80%. No one was really doing any research about these bats. So there's no data available. Uh, main reason, as you can see, these are the caves in which the bats are living. The caves obviously are uh, dumping sites. So this is literally a uh, public uh, rubbish. Uh, we managed the one on the right, we managed to clear. There's many more uh, caves we're supposed to clear from the, from the rubbish and so on, but it's very difficult. And also we not always have the money to do it. Uh, and from, uh, yeah, I'm trying to finish, from all the current projects we have ongoing now, uh, we work with the University of Mauritius and Professor Florence, and we have three PhD students, so I, I co supervise the students. So one of them is doing PhD on the Momopterus acetabulosus, so the Mauritian free tail bat, about the conservation, also try to realize why the population decreased so much, and then try to see the, uh, the foraging sites and the behavior, also uh, whether they... Uh, travel in between the caves. There are only, I think, four or five caves left with those bats. Uh, we do human bat conflict, I will also always do. So uh, there's another PhD student working on that and now working on the deterrence. So we're retesting the sound system. We also design a soundless system, which we'll test first time this year. So hopefully that will bring good result. 
And we're also looking at the impact of invasive species such as monkeys and rat on the forest ecosystem. So we already one PhD student finished last year. Uh, he was doing the competition between the monkeys and the fruit bats. Now we have another uh, PhD student uh, contributing more to that study and looking at different aspects of how the monkeys also affect the forest ecosystem. We also recently, a few years now, started to work with the Tel Aviv University and Professor Yovel. So with Yossi, we're trying to establish the Atlas system in Mauritius, which is the, one of the best systems to track animals now. So with this system, we'll be able to track the bats uh, in real life. Uh, we also look at the social behavior and decision making. But again, all these projects are done by students. There is a student from Tel Aviv doing uh, also the Atlas and the social behavior. So I assume uh, you can invite them to give the webinar for that. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, they're doing really cool stuff. And these are just some of the sponsor supporters and uh, organizations uh, to which I would like to say thank you. And um, I really think that there's not all of them are listed. So I apologize for that. And that's all. Thank you for your time. Oh, got completely dark here. Thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I'll just switch the light on. That's, that was great. Thank you very much for um, that excellent presentation, uh, Richard, and for telling us about the research and the applied work that you have been conducting um, in Mauritius. Um, we have time for questions. Um, I'm just going to get started with one question of my own. Mm -hmm. um, so you said there's about 2% of good quality forest yeah. left on the island, but presumably there's also some forest that's introduced. Species. Yes, I think uh, the forest is, so basically the total forest cover must be around 15, 20 percent. Uh, yeah. Around 5 percent probably is left, well, what we would say secondary forest, which may have some uh, uh, endemic species in it, and only the 2 percent of the forest are of a good quality. That means that it was actually restored. So it, it's not a primary forest. There's no primary forest, there's a secondary forest. And only the two person actually, uh, they managed, I think since 80s, they managed to restore it uh, to the point that there were actually no invasive, almost no invasive species. But presumably the bats from the, the sort of three clusters that you showed with your tracking data. So the bats are also using uh, the other they use the good quality forest. There are other studies, obviously, done about how they use the uh, the habitat in terms of uh, quality forest and then low quality forest. The one of the PhD students, as I mentioned as well, is working on that. Again, yes, the main three uh, clusters are the mountains, so this is where the forest is. And also, the other thing is that the bats rely on this area for roosting. So those bats are not super shy, but most of the time you will find them in the forest roosting on the trees. So they really these are the roosting sites for them. Yeah, I, I was just thinking it's an interesting sort of combination of factors. If the trees, even if it's non-native trees, are there to attract the bats, that's a good thing because that means then the seeds from the native species get to those places. So it's a balance between removing those invasive species uh, to enable the, the, the new seeds to establish and having something already there that sort of attracts the bats to those places in the first place. So yeah, just interested in, in, yeah, in yeah, that, definitely. Those sorts of dynamics. Yeah, there's a lot of invasive species the bats still feeding on, and uh, there's a lot of them they rely during the winter, especially. So yeah, there's a has to be a balance in that sense. We can't just get rid of all the invasive because the bats will end up uh, dead. <laughs> There'll be nothing to eat. Yeah. Uh, right. I'm gonna get on with the questions in the chat. Um, so there's one uh, from Lorraine asking if a census has been done. Uh, I'm guessing that's a bat census. Of the bat, yes, it has been done. Yeah, and also, also, if there's a possibility of cultivating an indigenous species that could be economically viable, so alternatives to mangoes or uh, leeches. Okay, uh, so yeah, with the census, yes, it has been done uh, every year, actually. Basically, the government established, estimated the population to be around 90 to 100,000 bats. And then when they started to call every year, they came up again with the 90,000. So they kept calling. So basically, according to the government, the population of those bats did not de decrease much. Um, so yeah, uh, how we can rely on the census, whether it's a good one or not good one, we don't know. This is what we have. That's the only, only data we have. Uh, when it comes to the endemic or native species, which can be economically valuable, we did think about it, and unfortunately, we do not see any of them. So that, that's the, that's a shame because there's nothing really 
none of the, like, let's say in the Asia, the, the bats are pollinating the durian uh, and the major pollinators. So this had a lot with the conservation of bats because people realized that if you don't have bats, you won't have durian. But in Mauritius, we don't have durian nor any other commercial or even endemic tree which could be commercialized uh, uh, to which we can uh, link the bats as, you know, as something that it's needed. That's another interesting um, question about culling um, and whether or not it's just focus on, on the bats um, or if there's other species, because you mentioned there's also a lot of damage from like birds and rats and, and, yes, and other yes, animals. Yes. So is it just the bats that are being culled? Yes, when it comes to culling, it's just the bats. I know that the government is controlling the number of crows in Mauritius, but we don't really see them causing any damage to the fruits. So yeah, when it comes to a cull, especially of an endemic uh, uh, species, it's only the bats. And no one's taking any action to basically control the number of other invasive species, such as monkeys or uh, or invasive birds, apart from crows. Yeah, and presumably the farmers, so are they aware that bats are just a relatively small component of the damage that's been done uh, to their... Um, yeah, it's, uh, we're trying with education and so on, and also by talking to the farmers, we're trying to explain that the bats are not the only one, but generally most of the damage will be blamed on uh, on the bats, even if it was done by the birds. They will keep arguing, you know, that is where bats. Yeah. Although some orchards realize and they try to implement some sort of noises during the day. So let's say if they have an orchard, like 20 trees, they were during the day, they will walk around and uh, try to make some noises to scare the birds because they start, mm -hmm. they're starting to realize that bats are not the only only species that they can save quite a lot of foods also if they try to deter the birds. And how easy is it? Because you showed that picture where you had the, the seeds and, and, and fruit and what it had been damaged. Yes, yes. So how easy is it to tell? Uh, how easy it is to tell? Uh, once you once you know what you're looking for, it's quite easy. It's uh, It really goes automatically at some point. But uh, it's simple, like with the birds, basically the seed or the fruit, uh, the seed generally will be smooth because the birds won't chew on the seed. Uh, when it comes to rats, we always have the seed. So in, the seed actually is eaten more than the flesh. When it comes to the bats, we will have the uh, canna is actually marked on the seed. So each time the bat is biting into a fruit, it will make a mark on the seed. So this is how we can distinguish all these different damages. Um, more questions, uh, lots of questions actually. Um, given that the native flora is so badly affected, are there seasons where the bats are completely dependent on fruit orchards, uh, orchards or invasive plants? Uh, we, well, it's difficult to say. Yes, the bats are definitely dependent on the orchard. We need to remember that this is uh, during the main fruiting season. So basically when the lychee comes to fruits uh, around uh, November to January, and this is the most valuable crop, this is when the bats are giving birth. So basically these are all the mothers flying with the pups and they do need the food. Uh, we found now with the recent studies that there is actually a pattern about the activity in the activity in the orchard. So we find them more active during the early hours than uh, during the late hours at night. So basically they come and feed on the lychee. They probably fool themselves with the food and they fly off to search for other food. We also need to remember that they cannot just really eat the lychee or mango or mango because uh, it just provides sugar. So there's a lot of other foods they need to they need to eat to get other minerals or like even the calcium for females when they're pregnant. Uh, so yeah, they definitely not completely dependent because they survive winter when there's no commercial fruits. Yeah, yeah. So that's related to another question actually. Um, do you think that bats can find enough wild fruiting trees to feed on, um, especially with with a growing population? Yeah, uh, basically, it's a very good question. Uh, we're definitely trying to justify that in, in many ways. Uh, there's definitely still enough food for them because they can survive the winter in the forest. Uh, but definitely with the with the current invasion and the degradation of the forest, uh, it's uh, the number, the, the number uh, of food available is decreasing from year to year. And probably that's why we see more and more damage in the orchards. Um, I was also interested in, so you mentioned the, the call and then the population, well, the damage increase a couple of years after. Yeah. I just wonder if you could sort of elaborate a bit more as to what, what the process behind that is. Uh, it's something we really, 
we've been doing these assessments of the orchards and we didn't really look about like let's compare like what happened before the call and after the call but once we started to get the results and i was going back to what we did in 2014 and 15 and then i realized come on like these are the same orchards the same trees we're checking and then the damage is increasing uh, so yeah it was not something we really expected but uh, again we started to look at it and realized that there's there's another problem it's not only the number of the bats but it's also the habitat available to bats so we started to connect it with definitely with the degradation of the forest and uh, the bats are becoming more dependent on the on the uh, commercial fruits during the summer yeah and i guess that's great uh, so the the restoration work that you're doing uh sort of at the ecosystem level rather than just focus on the species i think that's a a, a great approach and the right way to do it um and yeah there's another question related uh, to the outreach work that you do mm -hmm. so yeah i was along the same lines i was interested in the restoration work and how much you engage the communities on that and how keen are they to get involved and, and yeah if you could tell us a bit more about that uh, yeah sure uh so may, let's say in schools and so on the kids are really really keen and interested uh, when we do it in the welfare centers with the elder people uh, uh they less interested uh, in actually what we're saying and they will fill in the questionnaires and we will talk about the buzz and explain to them they will say oh yes 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 then they will refill the questionnaire and nothing will change so it depends on the it depends on the generation as well the some people just once they see that it's about the bats the bats will always be bad uh, the funny story is we also at some point made uh, bad looking cookies from i think from oreo there was like cupcakes with like looked like bats and some of the people did not want to eat it because it looked like a bat so the attitude toward bats is not the best here mm -hmm. Uh, maybe I'll just get through one more question because um, we're running out of time. Um, there's um, a comment from Australia uh, saying that the mango farmers uh, pick mm. the fruit green before the bats are interested in it and then ripping it in storage. Is that something that could work there as well? Yes, definitely. Uh, we we had a workshop actually with people farming in Australia about the mango and lychee and basically what they do, they trim the trees every day, uh, every year after fruiting. And uh, they managed to keep them to, to the lever that it's very easy to net it. So they actually use the nets to protect the fruits 100% from the bats. The problem in Mauritius is that no one wants to trim the trees because they believe if they trim it, the next year they won't get fruits. So they allow the tree to go higher and higher and higher. And eventually, when it comes to uh, backyards, for example, the tree is too tall to, to even pick up the fruit. So when people complain that the bats are eating all the mango or lychee, if we visit them, because sometimes we have calls, and we like uh, see the tree, which is like almost 10 meter, we ask like, so are you able to pick up the trees at the top of the tree? They say like, no, we can't. I was like, so what's the problem of bats eating it? They say like, yeah. because it's mango. <laughs> so they're eating <laughs> the mango, even though you won't be able to pick it up. When it comes about the picking up the green, yes, definitely it's possible they could do it, but uh, they not always do it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the orchards, maybe it's uh, it's when they sell when they collect mango for sale. It can be it can be picked up just about to be ripe, and then it's gonna ripen in the process. Uh, with the lychee, not so much, and in the backyards, people won't really bother to take it green. They wait for it to be ripe. When it's ripe, it's already getting eaten by the bats. And then the sound deterrence. Uh, that, that sounded yeah. like a pretty really interesting, uh, it's a very promising approach. Do you think that could be sort of implemented on a larger scale and sort of yes, yes, reduce the problem? Yeah, definitely. We, we're testing it now and hopefully we're counting on uh, on some grants to actually manage to do uh, uh, like a bigger experiment around the, about the sound system. Because so far we've been able to test it in like a few orchards only. So it would be nice to test it in many orchards at the same time and then collect the data. Uh, and yes, I do believe that this could be a solution. And hopefully in a few years, it's going to be the solution. Because there's nothing else I can think of now, just the sound and then the soundless system for the backyards. So yeah. if we manage to if we manage to fine tune it, I think that could solve the problem. Well, I think we'll finish on that positive note of finding solutions to, to solve the problems and to mitigate the damages uh, and help uh, bats uh, and bat conservation in the island. So there's lots of comments and questions in the chat. Everyone thanking you and saying a really interesting talk. So yeah, much. just to reiterate, uh, thank you very much for um, joining us today and for telling us about your work. Uh, and yeah, continue doing exciting research and restoration and conservation work. Uh, that is thank you very, very much. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, thanks everyone for joining us uh, and please uh, continue coming back to our webinars in future weeks. Um, thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks.